Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome uh, to this further uh, Neurology Academy uh, webinar. Um, I'm Richard Davenport. I I'm up in uh, Edinburgh, uh, and I'm ably supported today by my uh, two colleagues, Ross Dunn uh, and Ed Newman. Uh, more about them uh, in just a, a moment. Um, and thank you also to uh, Bial uh, for helping support uh, the, uh, the infrastructure of this, uh, this, this webinar. So we're going to talk specifically today about addressing some of the, the issues about uh, virtual or remote consulting in this time of COVID. And the reason we chose that subject was because um, it, when we had our webinar two or three weeks ago talking about some of the problems that both we and patients face uh, in the time of COVID, it became we, we got lots and lots of questions about the logistics and mechanics of undertaking remote consulting. Uh, so it seemed to us that, that it was a, a topic right, uh, right for, uh, for, for a presentation, and that's really what we've, what we've built it around. So I'm going to start off talking about some of the sort of generic logistics uh, and the motor assessment. Uh, then we're going to have Ross talking about the cognitive assessment, uh, followed by Ed talking about some of the non-motor features. Uh, just to remind you that you can ask questions as we go along in the Q&A box, as, as, as you know, um, and we'll try and pick those up. Uh, as we go along and at the end of each of our, 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 our presentations. Right, so, so, th so this, is, um, this is, I'm going to start off talking about remote or vir virtual consulting. Uh, this is uh, the view uh, uh, from across Edinburgh. Uh, as you'll realise, it was a view that was taken before social distancing. Uh, we're very keen on social distancing and isolation up here in Scotland. Uh, in fact, so keen that we, uh, we're, we're, we're less keen to relax our regulations up here than, than down in the rest of the country. Um, so this was a pre-COVID uh, photograph taken. Now, before we get into this, just a, a couple of uh, disclaimers. Firstly, uh, I suspect, like me, uh, you've had to sit through uh, any number of these kind of things uh, with people uh, telling you how to, do, how to make a phone call and how to undertake a phone consultation. Um, I should make it clear, I don't set myself up as an expert uh, in this area. All I'm really doing is I'm sharing with you my experience over the last few weeks. I'm sure that you and I have made the same uh, mistakes and learnt the same kind of things. Uh, I think that it, this might be most helpful uh, for those of you uh, who have been on the front line in the last few weeks and diverted from your clinics and perhaps now are coming back to your clinics. Uh, that hasn't happened to me. I've been very lucky. I've just carried on uh, doing remote consultations. Um, so, so I think I hope this would be of some help uh, to some of you. And the other thing to say is, is, is obviously we're talking very much about in time of COVID. So we found ourselves uh, in times of trouble. The problem is, is we couldn't just let it be. So we had to come up with some kind of solution to this. And again, just to be very clear, uh, I'm not some disciple for the whole idea of virtual consulting. Uh, as we'll see, I don't think in many situations it's an ideal replacement for what we used to do. Uh, I think things are going to change in the future. I think we are going to use more virtual consulting, but I certainly don't think it's going to replace uh, a real face, a typical face-to-face -face, uh, consultation. So just to get those two things uh, off my chest straight away. So I guess as with all these, these things, what do we call it? Um, people refer to it as remote consulting. One of my patients pointed out the idea the other day that actually remote consulting had, had a sort of rather negative consultation and felt, and, and that hadn't really occurred to me. Um, so maybe virtual cons consulting uh, or whatever word we use. So what we're gonna be talking about, um, we've all used the phone for many years. We're, we're sort of familiar with using telephone uh, follow-up Really what we're sort of talking here is the, the video enhanced element uh, of the, the consultation. Uh, we'll come to these uh, various different kinds uh, of, of, of platforms or media uh, in just a moment, but that's really what we're gonna be speaking about uh, today. What we're not talking about is the kind of thing that my colleagues up in Aberdeen have very much trailblazed with and done for many years, and that's hospital to hospital video consulting. Uh, so this is when uh, my colleagues will sit in their clinic in Aberdeen uh, and will link up to the hospital in Stornoway, for instance, and the patient will have come to the local hospital at Stornoway uh, and they'll have a remote consultation. The advantage of that from us, of course, is that you've got somebody at the other end who can assist with the, uh, with the clinical examination. So that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about just 
consulting between ourselves directly uh, with patients. So I'm just going to so I'm going to share you, with you uh, the experience that I've had over the last few weeks, which I suspect will be very similar to the other experience of you. Um, for local reasons, you, you'll, you'll know that the NHS platform is confusingly called Attend Anywhere. Uh, I think that's what you still call it down uh, down in England. Of course, we like to be different up here, so it's been rebranded near me, but it's all the same thing. Um, uh, I work in a health board which has um, refused to accept uh, Attend Anywhere or near me uh, up until the COVID crisis because of concerns of confidentiality. So now we're doing a big catch up uh, with near me. So I don't have much experience of using the sort of NHS branded version. Uh, and most of my experience has been uh, with these things. Um, uh, so firstly, I've been doing most of my clinics uh, from home rather than in the clinic. Uh, and I've been using a combination of Skype, FaceTime uh, and phone. And I've very much tailored that depending on what clinic uh, I've been doing. Um, Monday, uh, you'll find me doing an all day clinic in first seizure clinics. And of course that's very much history driven. So much of that has been done on the phone. Uh, ditto my general neurology clinics. I've been looking at, 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 the, at the sort of particularly the new patients, what's involved uh, and using the phone for a lot of those. It's really the sort of movement disorder and a motor neurone disease clinic uh, where I've been sort of using video much more, uh, but certainly for the new patients. Reviews, of course, you, you, can, you can decide uh, by having a look what, what you think, sometimes phone uh, or video. And we have been bringing up one or two patients up for face-to-face -face, uh, consultations. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll give you three examples uh, of, of, of how these have all worked uh, later on. So I guess there's a few basic rules when you do this sort of thing as you learn, as you go along. Um, so first of all, you need an adequate internet connection. That's relevant if you work at home, of course. What we've discovered is we've had problems at the other end. Uh, so I've, for several years, uh, I've been remote accessing the electronic platform on NHS Lothian without any problems. Uh, of course, six weeks ago, about a thousand of my mates piled in uh, and joined in. And of course, the whole thing just fell over almost immediately. And it took several weeks to collect, to, 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 to resolve that. It is now finally resolved. But that was a real problem. And you could be in the middle of a phone call in the middle of a clinic and the whole platform would fall over and then refuse you access for several hours. Uh, and, and, and you can imagine that's rather difficult. And there were a couple of clinics where I just had to abandon home and race into the hospital and access the system there. So, so but we're, we're, we're working those things out as we go along. Needs to be appropriate. Of course, you've got control over your end, less control over the other end. Um, uh, sort of adequate lighting. As I'm, as, I'm, as I'm giving this talk, I'm very aware the sun is coming out over there. And I've got a light here, so I know my face is going dark and black. I can't control the sun, unfortunately. It's nice to see it up in Scotland every now and then. Um, uh, but, but, but just adequate lighting. Background, I mean, as you know, you can put in, you can put in a sort of blank background. Uh, but try not to have anything too distracting uh, in the background. I think we all recognize that, I mean, dress, just, just dress as you would normally for a clinic, uh, I think is, 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 is the bottom line. Uh, try not to be too relaxed. Uh, and of course, the whole issue of, of, of camera angle, making sure that you're clearly visible. These, of course, are completely relevant at the other end. You have less control over those. And I think in due course, once we start to accept this more and more, I think patients might get more information about the kind of setup uh, to have. I haven't had too much problem with that kind of setup, but I know some of my colleagues have found themselves staring at patients' hands or cleavage or whatever it might be without being able to sort of see the faces because of the difficulty of the, the tablet or the, or the phone or whatever it might be. Um, so so, so, so those, are, those are important things to think about. One of the sort of problems that we've encountered, well, of course, predominantly there have been IT uh, issues initially. Um, one of the things that's quite difficult, it's quite difficult, um, if not impossible, to immediately Skype or FaceTime somebody who's not expecting it. So often we've had to make a, f a brief phone call, first of all, establish they've got the, the, the kit and then, and, and then dial it up. And, and it, it works reasonably well. Um, there is a problem of unfamiliarity with technology, and I think that for me, certainly, that's both ends. Um, I'm slowly sorting myself out. I have the advantage of two teenagers at home who can help me uh, with all the complicated stuff, so I've, I've managed to overcome most of that. 
there is an issue, as you're well aware, uh, of people, particularly when we're talking about Parkinsonism, we're often dealing with older people and without wishing to sound pejorative, um, there are plenty of older people who are very au fait with technology, if not more so uh, than I, uh, but equally there are people who, who either have no technology or limited technology and that can be uh, difficult. And I think we've all had the problem of glitchy connections, whether that's on the phone or whether that's video, uh, and that can sometimes be difficult, uh, but not much you can do about that. Otherwise, the problems, are that they're very much as the, as, as the clinic, of course. I mean, patients with cognitive impairment or language or communication difficulties, these are just the same in the virtual world. They seem somehow more difficult in the virtual world, even when you've got video. Um, I think, I think that these things are just magnified when, you, when you're trying to do a virtual consultation. Hopeless historians are hopeless historians, whether they're on the phone or video or whether they're in your room. Um, but again, I think they just see that their hopelessness seems to be magnified uh, when you're trying to do uh, virtual uh, consultations. Uh, and of course, uh, inter interrupting partners, uh, very, you know, you very much want to partners to be involved, as we'll see, they play another important role in a moment. Um, of course, at the moment, if people are following lockdown correctly, or the only person you're lucky to get is a spouse um, rather than other, other family members. Although, again, my experience is that uh, if they know the consultation is coming, other families often uh, pitch in and turn up. And that, and that can be helpful as well, but you just need to uh, have the rules and people, one person talking at a time, which can be uh, sort of difficult. So what are the things that you lose or what are what I think you, you lose? Well, of course, there's all the nonverbal stuff that you lose, even with, a, even with a, a, a video feed. I think actually there's a lot of the sort of verbal interaction, a lot of, a lot of the kind of um, uh, sort of less clinical stuff, but the kind of thing that makes an, a, a consultation a good or a bad consultation. I think that's more difficult doing it verbally, doing it virtually. Um, I think that's probably why most of the consultations are shorter. Uh, which some of us might view as a good thing, but I think you do lose out some of that establishing rapport, which I think is particularly important uh, with some of the new patients. Uh, we'll come to examination in just a moment, but obviously the examination sometimes uh, is a bit li limited. One of the interesting things I've discovered, so all our patients are being phoned in advance and, and told when their appointment is, so they are expecting their appointment. And again, I think this might apply more to younger people perhaps than older, but I think there's something about the idea it's a virtual consultation that makes them think it's, it's more relaxed. Um, I've spoken to at least two people whilst they were in the bath, which was a bit weird. Um, both of them were at lunch. I, I hasten to add they were phone consultations rather than, uh, thank goodness, uh, video. Um, but also I've come up, you know, people have been out and about shopping and of course it's quite difficult to have a proper consultation. So I think again, I think one of the things we're going to learn is that when patients are offered virtual consultations for the future, uh, I think that's one of the important things to make clear that they need to be somewhere where they can concentrate, not distracted, not doing something else. They need to prepare for the appointment as, as, as they would normally for an appointment. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the things that I've discovered. So what about the, 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 the examination? So, so, so thinking specifically about Parkinsonism, what can, we, what can we do in terms of the examination? Well, again, we've, we've, we've made the point, you need good connection for video, glitchy video is, is, is awful. I think it's really helpful if they've, if they've got a partner here because they effectively can be the camera operative. Uh, and certainly tablet and mobile is probably better than laptop, of course the least maneuverable thing is a desktop. Um, but I think when you do them, when people are on their own, it's quite difficult, certainly when you want to get them to watch them walk, for instance, and they just wander off out of shot. That's not terribly helpful. But, but, but if you've got somebody to operate the camera and again, a, 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 a bit of space. Um, I, 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 like many people, I've been used to our PD nurses coming back from home visits and telling us the sort of slight uh, merry chaos that some of our patients sort of live in. Uh, and it's interesting insight into people's bedrooms or, 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 or front rooms. Uh, and you see uh, all the sort of, um, the, sort of the, the, the sort of obstacles that they have to maneuver around, sort of dogs and cats and bits of furniture uh, and so forth, uh, which just add to their sort of falls risk in some, 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 some situations. Uh, so, so it is an interesting insight that you get to their, to their room. 
So what can you do? Um, well, I think, I mean, very obviously, we're, 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 you, could, you can get a, a, an immediate overall appearance. So you can see as long as your video connection is good, you can see abnormal movements and you can look at their face, of course, which is important in terms of Parkinsonism. Um, uh, you can uh, look in terms of specifics. Uh, I'll leave cognition uh, to Ross uh, in a moment. Cranial nerves, I think, are relatively limited. I think you certainly can look at the face and get an idea of their speech and maybe drooling. Uh, I know people have sort of talked about examining eye movements uh, virtually. Uh, I've tried it once. I'm not going to do it again. I think if your diagnosis is dependent on eye movements, you're already struggling a little bit. I, 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 I must admit I've given up doing that. I think you just have to sort of be uh, relatively generic. Certainly bradykinesia you can certainly test and we can certainly do uh, piano playing uh, or, or finger taps um, or feet with, with the feet. Of course, you need to make sure they're on the camera. And of course, what often happens is they kind of put their hand out of the way and they sort of doing their finger taps off camera. So you need to get them to put them in front of the camera. It's interesting how sometimes people are not quite sure where their camera is on, a, on, on an iPad or a tablet uh, or a laptop. Uh, so, so sometimes you just need to practice uh, making sure that they're in front of the camera. Getting up, and, the get up and go test, the walking test, that depends of course upon the environment and that's where the partner becomes really a key person. It's quite difficult to do that if they're on their own unless they're very clever at keeping in shot. So, so that's the, the value of a partner. And there are other things that you can get them to do. So, so drink a glass of water, see, look at their tremor, do some handwriting again, remembering the importance of making sure that it's actually uh, in shot. I haven't yet found a good way of assessing tone virtually. I think that's quite tricky, other than just looking at somebody overall and recognizing that there's someone uh, very stiff uh, and slow. Um, so those are, the, those are the things you can do in terms of examination. Um, I think in terms of, of, of bringing the, 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 the consultation to a close, well, it's very much as if you're in clinic, it's talking to them about the diagnosis if they're a new patient and you think you've got one and the plan for moving forwards. I think sometimes you do, you, you do learn quickly that, that you need to take the lead in, in terms of terminating a consultation. Um, some of the, the non-verbal cues that you can give off in a face-to-face -face consultation are less obvious and obviously followed up with a, with a letter as you would do normally to the general practitioner, patient and your, your PD nurse. I think, I think it probably is important to document the form of consultation that you had. Uh, we've always assumed it was face to face, but I think nowadays it's important to document whether it was phone, whether it was Skype, whether it was FaceTime, uh, what kind of consultation it was. So I'm just going to finish off with, with, with three quick cases, which, which, which I hope demonstrate some of the pros and cons of virtual uh, consultation. So the first one was, was a 72-year-old uh, man. The GP referral sounded very ominous. Um, progressive dysarthria, dysphagia over a short period of time with weight loss. Uh, he'd all actually been seen pre-lockdown in the ENT clinic for this uh, and, and, and the letter saying no ENT pathology identified. And nine and a half times out of ten, that's motor neurone disease. Um, so I attempted a phone consultation, but when I called, his wife was out, she'd gone shopping, he was on his own. It was almost impossible to understand what he was saying, so quickly abandoned that. And I, I arranged a face-to-face -face consultation uh, and got our MND nurse up as well. And so we were all busy, we sort of, we had our masks and gowns on, uh, and in came this man. And very quickly, within a few minutes, it dawned on me that actually this was myasthenia gravis and not motor neurone disease, which is a good outcome for him, uh, later confirmed with his positive antibodies. And I just, I can't tell you why, but there was something about the face-to-face -face that made the penny drop very quickly that I'm not sure I would necessarily have got with either a video or a phone consultation. So it, it, it's really just, it's emphasizing that, that this is that virtual, virtual consulting is, is not a replacement for face-to-face. -face. And I don't want anybody going away thinking that, I, that I'm, a, I'm a, di a disciple of that, I'm not. Uh, but we recognize in the current climate, uh, we've, got to, we've got to do a lot of stuff uh, virtually, but, 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 but there are things that you sometimes lose. So the second one, again, the GP referral letter, just reading it was very suggestive of Parkinson's disease, unilateral uh, left arm tremor over the last year, gradually becoming more obvious. 
and her mother had had Parkinson's disease. Um, so I sort of uh, sort of spoke to her. Uh, I actually actually rang her up and said, you know, do you have FaceTime or Skype? And she said, I've got FaceTime. So uh, we immediately uh, agreed. I put the phone down and FaceTimed her. And the minute I saw her, it was immediately obvious that she didn't have Parkinsonism. And in fact, she was essential tremor, which I'm sure is what her mother actually had, not Parkinson's disease. Uh, but again, I could have got quite a long way with a phone consultation without picking up on any of those clues. And I could have been asking all sorts of questions about Parkinson's, whereas a face to face, you would immediately have clocked having called her in the waiting room, watched her walk in, that actually this was not Parkinson's and then thereby pursuing uh, an alternative uh, option. And the, and, and the last case is, is, is really kind of the reverse of this. So this was somebody who was, who was actually triaged the general neurology clinic. It was a fairly vague referral and she had fairly vague symptoms, to be fair, uh, a lot of fatigue uh, and lethargy and a bit of apathy and that kind of thing. The sort of stuff that you have to work quite hard for uh, on a phone consultation. And, and just halfway through the phone consultation, I, I, I just I, I really wasn't I didn't really know what was wrong with her. But I just said, look, do you, do you have FaceTime or Skype? Again, she had FaceTime. Um, and again, the minute we went on to FaceTime and just the moment you saw her, the diagnosis was immediately obvious. She was, she was very Parkinsonian. And of course, all the rest then fitted into place. And you thought, yes, OK, now the penny's dropped. That's, that, that's what this is. this is. This is Parkinsonism. But again, face to face, you would have picked that up straight away. Uh, but it took quite a while for the penny to drop because I was struggling uh, on the phone. So again, maybe an advert just just to confirm that, 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 that we haven't seen the end of face-to-face -face consultations, I'm pleased to say. So, so just to summarise, the virtual consultations, I mean, by, by default, we've had to use them. Uh, they're certainly very useful. Uh, and I think we are going to use these more and more in the future. I think probably their main role is going to be uh, in review. Um, they're a useful adjunct, but they're certainly not a replacement for what I've called the real thing, by which I mean face to face. Uh, and I think we've got a lot of thinking to do about how we might use these for the future. Uh, and we're sort of making these up, the, the rules up uh, as we go along. So that's all I was, I, I, I was going to say. Um, we haven't had any questions yet. We did have a question in advance, which I'll maybe just take right now. And that was, how do you, mon how do you review or monitor motor symptoms uh, over the phone? Um, uh, well, I guess that, that's really the fu functionality, isn't it? That, that, that's asking about the kind of things that they can do, their mobility, how they're functioning around the house, those kind of things. I suppose that's the answer to that. But again, you know, you can see that video would enhance uh, that. I think, I, think, I think the phone is a kind of mono version uh, and you really want stereo sound uh, for these consultations. So, so, so if at all possible, uh, audio uh, would be a good thing. Well, what we'll do is we'll pass on to our second uh, uh, presenter. Uh, so Ross, Ross Dunn is a, a, is a, a psychiatrist down uh, in Manchester uh, with a big interest uh, in dementia and cognitive problems. And is going to talk to us about the virtual assessment for, for cognitive. So Ross, welcome over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, so as Richard mentioned, I'm an old age psychiatrist working in Greater Manchester Mental Health Trust and uh, currently working on an inpatient ward, which is so far COVID free um, and doing telephone consultations along with my sometimes sequestered colleagues. Um, some people have been uh, in lockdown for some time now, some of my older uh, uh, colleagues. Um, so we, we are um, sort of uh, everybody, of course, is reinventing um, themselves as a, as a, a, a telemedic. Um, but I'd, I'd like to echo some of what Richard has said. Um, I don't see this as, I'm not a disciple of, of telemedicine. I don't see it as a substitute for um, really good quality face-to-face uh, -face assessment. And, uh, and of course, a lot of what I do is actually in people's homes, going and, and doing assessments in their front room and seeing the depth and, and wealth of, of all of their, their functioning right there. So all of that is completely lost except for the glimpses, as you mentioned, that you might see um, over somebody's shoulder of the cat jumping onto um, the wardrobe and tipping over a lamp. You know, that this is a sort of, um, what, how did you put it, a uh, uh, merry chaos. Um, so I'm going to talk to you, um, uh, one of the, the um, barriers that we've seen is that when we've suggested doing cognitive assessment, 
um, either um, televisually or um, telephonically. Um, we've come up uh, a against a little bit of a barrier uh, in terms of neuropsychology, being very wary about us jumping to conclusions about those results, about making sort of rash decisions about whether somebody or has or hasn't got cognitive impairment on the basis of those things. Because we recognize that using this technology puts a cognitive load on people. Using a FaceTime takes up working memory, takes up CPU space. And so um, you're likely to get sort of lower performance. But um, uh, that is uh, true and not true. So it will depend on educational attainment. It will depend on how cultured somebody is to using the, the uh, technology. And we know, for example, that the uptake of smartphones in the 65 to 75 age category it's about 20 to 25 percent depending on socioeconomic group whereas in other age categories it's pervasive sometimes people have two and um and sort of familiarity with the technology in the younger age group takes up less processing time it's overlearned behavior they're much more familiar with the material um however this has been studied so it's worthwhile that, uh, arming yourself with some of the knowledge about um, some of the studies that have been done they're all sort of pre-covid studies and i'll talk to you at the very end very briefly about some of the research that we're hoping to do very shortly on remote cognitive assessment in a slightly different way and embracing it in a little bit more uh, more of a sort of uh, uh, an electronic uh, uh, a rapid and, and, and brief assessment way and not trying to wedge what we're already doing into a telemedical or telephonic uh, uh, sort of a, a mold. So um, I've no shares in anything. I don't take money from pharmaceutical companies. Um, nobody's an expert in this. Nobody knows what they're doing here. We're all making it up as we go along. And uh, that's absolutely fine. Feel, you know, feel free. If you have a good idea, Somebody else might have had it, but you might be the only one. So feel free to share it too, um, and use all of this with care. You know, um, you you should not jump to conclusions on the basis of telephonic cognitive assessment, but it can be part of the information pool that helps you make good clinical decisions in a time when it's really difficult to do so. So um, I'll talk very briefly about key recent papers. I'll talk very briefly about some domain-specific tests. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the ad adaptation of traditional bedside tests. I personally don't think this is the way to go, but this is how it has been done so far. Um, I'll talk about the MMSC. Not at all, because I hate it. It's terrible. You should never use it. You shouldn't use it face-to-face. -face. It's rubbish in Parkinson's. Um, so um, yeah, feel free not to use that ever. But I will talk a little bit about how the MOCA has been adapted for um, telemedical use. Okay, so jumping right in, um, a, a lovely textual slide, um, but focus down here. This is a study done by Marceau et al, published in the International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, the Orange Journal, and there's your DOI if you want to look it up. So this was 18,000 stroke-free American participants participants. These were the control group from a large study, the REGARD study of variability in stroke outcome in the US. And they simply developed norms, so normative testing for F fluency, verbal fluency, and animal naming. Um, and they were a hugely diverse group, so a very good balance of African American and white, um, large age diversity, and quite a good diversity of educational attainment as well, and a good gender balance. Um, um, they were able to develop a really lovely normal curve. So this is really important for the diagnosis phase. This allows you to um, sort of standardize your, your um, speed of processing cognitive test. This is the F and animal naming tests. And normally this is a time test, so it's quite a good sort of high ceiling test. Um, and this can give you an idea about sort of processing speed. And this is why I've included it here, because of course we know that in Parkinson's disease, dementia and the dementia with the weak bodies, it's bradykinesia, but it's also bradyphrenia, just this slowing of processing, this subcortical pattern, um, which can be uh, difficult to detect. And of course, sometimes what we're trying to do is develop a personal tra trajectory of decline for that person, or uh, in the case of, of uh, the Lewy body diseases, a, a, a pattern of fluctuation. Um, and then we have some more assessments that are from Monroe Cullum's group. So Monroe Cullum has sort of pioneered these assessments and his other interest is in Native American populations, which is what you see that 50% of this population are Native American. These are, this is where remote medicine does mean remote sometimes. Um, and uh, so he's been a pioneer of this for many, uh, many, many years. Um, and what they've done here is sort of validate the traditional neuropsychological assessments face to face against the same person, the same tester doing this, the, the, the same test uh, by video link or telephone link. 
um, and they found really good correlations. So um, the, it's not one to one, it's not perfect, but we are talking about correlations in the range of sort of 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, um, which if you do any research is kind of staggering fall off your chair cor correlation. So they, they, it's the same test in the same person, you'd expect it to be pretty good, but you would expect a little bit more information loss, or I would expect a little bit more information loss than that. Okay, and these were obviously not terribly impaired people, which I think is quite important. Here's the MMSC mean, um, and that means, you know, you've got the ability to still use the technology, still engage with it, still um, uh, take turns in conversation without misrepresenting cues and misunderstanding those kinds of nonverbal and verbal um, uh, phonological cues. So we, we talk a lot in psychiatry about prosody and the ability to, to sort of inject music into a stream of speech. And that's a lot of what cues us, that somebody's coming to the end of a sentence, for example, or, or beginning a sentence, beginning a phrase, or starting a new topic. It's what cues us that somebody's frustrated with us on the end of a phone. And, and some of that is lost early on, both with auditory impairment, uh, but also with cognitive impairment. So something to be aware of, uh, something that in the psychological science is really well studied. Okay. And I'll leave you with the table, but essentially their findings were that um, it, the tele, teleneuropsychology, as they, they've coined the phrase here, can work um, and is comparable to traditional face-to-face -face test administration. Now, I'd say administration, maybe. Yeah, I think administration uh, of these tests can really, really work down the, down the phone or, or by video link. Um, what I would say, though, and one of the, the really valued uh, concerns of the neuropsychologist is that um, uh, assessment is often therapeutic. So if you're assessing somebody, you're often feeding back and there's this kind of dawning on them and sometimes relatives, I know you'll have seen this, that actually the problem is much bigger than they thought or there's a specific domain that's particularly impaired. And when we're doing a neuropsychological, neuropsychological assessment, what we're trying to do is feed back positives and negatives, your strengths and your weaknesses um, in a very therapeutic way. And it's quite difficult to do that, I think, down the phone. Um, so it's about information in, yes, we can do that, but giving information out and it's sort of a breaking bad news, gently uh, eking it out, it's, that can be quite difficult, I think, uh, remotely. Okay, and all of the, if there was a difference, the, the, the differences were small. So um, really, even if they'd had, a, you know, a thousand per group, the, this was not um, uh, particularly concerning. So um, now the telephone mocha. So this is, um, uh, you know, you'll all be uh, familiar with the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's been validated post-stroke. It's been validated against the mocha itself, but also the telephone interview, which we're going to talk about next. There's a five-minute protocol. So this might be something that's really useful in primary care, where you're trying to establish, is there a problem? What's the degree of the problem? And um, what do we do next? So is this a valid route for a referral? Because some of the referrals we've been getting from primary care in the, in the um, plague year have been sort of frankly cursory. Um, people are obviously on, in lockdown. So they're relying on um, um, collateral history. And, and sometimes the collateral history is not taking account of the sort of burden and stress of, of lockdown itself and everything that's occurring in that relationship. Um, and it will be interesting to see, looking backwards, I think, how much cognitive impairment was exposed by the fact that people were enclosed in a house together for sort of 12 weeks. Um, how, 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 when you run out of past assault conversations and isn't the weather lovely today conversations and start to have conversations about things that are a bit, a bit tougher, perhaps that exposes a bit more cognitive impairment. But I think there are tools out there that we could possibly give to primary care colleagues that might be a bit more useful for sort of screening the, the severity of this. And, and MOCA are aware of how useful their tool is. I'm a really big fan of the MOCA because it, it has got good sensitivity for executive dysfunction. And that's one of the earliest signs of um, uh, Lewy body disease associated cognitive impairment. Um, so you can log on to their website, you need to register on their website, um, but then they have um, a whole page of how to administer the MOCA sort of remotely. And it's incredibly well put together and very well, um, uh, very useful. Um, and they refer to some of, the, uh, some of their own uh, literature there, some of the validated uh, research. Um, and then we come to the telephone interview of cognitive status. Now you'll know that I hate the MMSE. The MMSE was invented over lunch by um, Marshall Falstein in about 1973. Um, and, but of course, it has this wonderful currency value, doesn't it? So everybody knows what 15 is, everybody knows what 20 is. Um, however, it's, it's beautifully insensitive to the, the kind of cognitive problems that we see in Parkinson's disease, dementia, or dementia with the bodies. You often start out with this kind of dopamine disexecutive uh, syndrome. 
So I much prefer the Azor, which was initially developed for frontal temporal dementia, very ex it's kind of exquisitely sensitive to, to executive dysfunction, and, uh, and the Maka. Um, but the ticks uh, and the ticks uh, modified have been validated for many, many years now, and there's quite a bit of literature behind them. Um, so I've put up the link to the original paper, and we can drop that into, um, into a, a page for you or, or get it to you some other way. So the PDF is there available from ResearchGate free. Um, there's lots of normative data, it's available in loads of languages. And so this might be something that, again, that we offer to either primary care colleagues or we tag on at the end of, a, of a, um, uh, an assessment to make sure that nothing serious has changed. Um, it would be useful, of course, to have a text from previously, but uh, I don't think we were doing that much telephone cognitive assessment two years ago, so that's kind of unlikely. Um, and here's the detail. It's just as simple as could be. Um, what's today's date? Where are you right now? Count backwards from 20 to 1. So good working memory tasks. Um, a list of 10 words, which is my absolute favorite memory test. If you were a cognitive test altogether, if you were going to be trapped on a desert island and you had nothing else, uh, a list of 10 words is what you'd want in your back pocket. Ideally, low visualization words. So words that you have to remember in an auditory manner. Um, and you get you know, sort of four goes at that and re then repeat. It's one of the most exquisite tests for hippocampal dysfunction. Maybe you can rule out Alzheimer's if you're good at it. So um, they, they don't offer four tests here. That would be excruciating, wouldn't it, down the phone? So um, there's, one, uh, there's one effort here. Uh, and then we move on to sort of, um, you know, your, your um, dysphagia test. Now we have some buts, uh, Methodist Episcopal. Um, I like Brompton bicycles on uh, Peterborough buses, but uh, everybody has their own little phrase. Um, who's the president of the United States? We'll gloss over that one. Um, um, with your finger, tap the phone five times. Now this is a tricky one, I think. Uh, you could easily get this right or get this wrong. I'm sure nobody knows where the microphone on their phone is either these days. Um, it's not like the old sort of handheld days. Um, and I, 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 what I really like is a little test of abstraction and, and uh, obviously vocabulary and socioeconomic group and the literacy and all of those things, kind of things folded in here. But I'm going to give you a word and I want you to give me its opposite. For example, the opposite of hot is cold. What is the opposite of west? Um, so um, what's the opposite of generous? Um, uh, last slide. So what are we doing about this? Because we've realized that we had a dearth of knowledge about this and actually um, there's a huge amount of technology we could be using. So with John Ainsworth's group in Manchester University, we've decided to dive straight into this and we have an application called My Mind Check, um, which is um, meant to cue you on your mobile phone or a mobile phone we give you to um, assess your cognition, a working memory function over the course of um, sort of six times per day. And that will tell us about sort of micro fluctuations in cognition in these two small groups. And um, so a uh, Louis Body Society application goes in at the uh, beginning of next week. And we're very hopeful that um, it's a hot topic and uh, it's pretty solid grant applications. So we're very hopeful that we're going to be able to uh, get through that. So I'll hand you back to uh, Richard now, if that's okay. Ross, thanks very much. That was uh, that was really really good stuff. Um, just I, I, I mean, there's a couple of questions, but if I if I may just come in first of all. So so you've talked about mocker and you've talked about ticks. Do you have a preference? Are, are they, can you use both? Is there any advantage you use I, both, or what? Would you, I, how I, you? I like the mocker. Yeah. Um, I have. Um, uh, no experience or, or, or uh, two experiences with the ticks because we I just we've just kind of dug it up um, so um, I think my experience with um, Marshall Falstein's tests is that he um, and it's just the same guy that developed the ticks so it's this um, it, he's Alzheimer's focused and so mm -hmm. it's likely that you've seen the 10 word test in there and um, it's like there's no visual spatial function test obviously and all those kinds of things so um, it's much more focused on Alzheimer's disease. Maka, I would think if I was looking at somebody with Lewy body disease, I would be asking very different questions. And of course, you're putting it together in a picture, you're asking about fluctuation, you're asking about visual hallucinations. It's not all just about the test. Um, and, and, and again, that's really important. More than ever, it's not just about the end score. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, we, so, so one question uh, we've got here. So firstly, do we have to pay for the Maka? And, and would you suggest Parkinson's nurses using the ticks or, or, or the Maka? I think the mock, uh, I'm not sure what um, uh, Dr. Ziaruddin has done over the course of COVID. Um, other test suppliers have relaxed their, their um, costing and, and sort of made things free. Um, so I, 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 I can't find that out for you. Um, the mock T on the website does suggest that it's available for free. So I think you have to register and log in. Then I think you can download the test. 
Yeah. Um, and as I said, there's a rate of free material there. There's loads of free material on that website. That, 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 I mean, that's certainly my understanding as well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Another one. We, so can a non-psychiatric expert, i.e. a PD nurse, perform these? Um, I like the mocker and do face-to-face. -face. Can, can we do remotely too? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're not, we're, there's no experts in this. No. So, um, uh, yes, it will help if you've done 10,000 face-to-face mockers. Um, but I, my experience with PD nurses is they're doing a lot of this. And actually, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you, you deal with more Parkinson's patients than I am. So, you know, you should uh, feel free to do what you do what you can do and then caveat the results and just say that our our confidence intervals are bigger now because we we have to be you know more skeptical about our own ability to assess people and a sort of a, a similar a, 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 a similar question uh, so someone saying uh, they've used a, a blind mocker over the phone which i suppose means that they've, they've, they've used the traditional mocker over the phone are there any drawbacks to doing that so Richard, I think they're talking about the mocker blind, which is a specific test for people with visual impairment. Thank you. Which doesn't, Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't rely on the visual spatial stuff. So no, I think that's perfect. And that's from what um, uh, Dr. Ziadadan has drawn the, the team mocker. So I think that's, um, that's uh, uh, an innovation uh, uh, on your own. And I think that's uh, uh, excellent, really. We, this is the kind of thing we should be trying to do. Excellent. Well, so, 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 I, so I've definitely learned something there. There's a blind mocker. So I there's a mocker <laughs> blind, there's a mocker in Urdu, Greek, any uh, language you can imagine, and uh, all kinds oh. of uh, tailoring for, for yes. various bits of impairment. Okay, great. Well, Ross, with that, thank you very much. For that, 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 that was an excellent presentation. So there was a question, so, so, so someone asked me, uh, would I ever consider testing eye movements in the future? I, I assume you mean virtually rather than just generally ever. Um, well, I, I guess... I mean, I, I, I suppose the point I was making is that I think the value you get out of testing eye movements um, in a sort of slightly um, awkward manner is relatively limited. Um, uh, I think it depends a lot on, on, on the sort of color of the eyes, the lighting, uh, how you can do it, your connection. You, you know, if all those things are perfect, you, you, you can test uh, sort of voluntary eye movements and you can have a go at doing pursuit. It's not straightforward. Um, so I don't mind people trying. I, I just think that actually the result, the effort you put in and, and, the, and the result you get back uh, is probably not justified. And I guess the point is I would maybe concentrate more on the, 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 the more straightforward things, which probably tell you far more information. Um, uh, that would that, 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 that's really my, 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 my view. Um, again, I think I think you can get a lot of we're, we're fortunate in a way in, in the field of Parkinsonism because you know we, we're all used to that idea of calling the patient out and the, the new patient out in the waiting room and you make the diagnosis there and then just 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 seeing them stand up and as they walk through you kind of know straight away that they're Parkinsonian uh, so you're sort of fed into that um, uh, and, and, and sure yes as a neurologist you'd expect me to say that eye movements are important and yes of course I do test them when we're face to face um, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm not stopping you doing it. I just am suggesting that maybe the amount of effort that you put in uh, is perhaps uh, not, 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 not well rewarded. That, that's the only point I, 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 I would make with, uh, with, with, with that. Certainly, so, I mean, listening to sort of Ross's start, I mean, I've, I've been very wary about doing any cognitive testing so far. Um, and I think that yeah, I've learned uh, quite a lot of uh, useful stuff from that and we'll use it. We've got another question coming through here. Anyone use test your memory for cognitive assessment remotely? How reliable is that if you've used it? Um, Ross, do you have a, a, a comment on that? Yes, I think test your memory, the Tim test is Jerry Brown's test. Um, and he's been um, an advocate, shall we say, if not a, um, a, 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 a pusher of the test uh, from um, the East of England over many, many years. Um, it's a good test, it correlates well with the MMSC, it correlates well with the ASOR. I think um, it's a short test um, mm. and it could potentially be done um, minus any visual component over the phone. All of these things though, I mean, I, I just, the, 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 the theme is the same. Um, we need to take with enormous um, handfuls of salt our results at the best of times. Um, we, in, we interpret them in the context of the patient, in the context of the trajectory of the client, in the context of the living situation, literacy, culture, language ability, all of that. And, and um, we ju we're just getting less precise results over the phone. And like yourself, 
um, when somebody comes into clinic, what I'm looking at is, are they a, a, somebody with them? Um, how do they mobilize from, you know, can they hear me? Um, what's their attention like in the waiting room? Um, um, you know, we have a larger degree of vascular cognitive impairment up here in the North uh, West. Um, so how are they managing the multiple um, sources of information? It's noise in the background and I'm calling, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about putting all of that in context and just, you know, being more skeptical than ever of one single number. So we'll, we'll, we'll turn now to, to, our, to our third, uh, and uh, Ed Newman uh, is a neurologist like myself, uh, about 40 miles uh, to my right uh, down the uh, M8, uh, the other end of the M8 in Glasgow, uh, and Ed's a, a movement disorder specialist. I'm going to talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the non-motor side of things uh, in this time of virtual consulting. Ed? Thank, thanks for asking me to speak. Um, non-motor symptoms isn't always the easiest thing um, to diagnose and talk about. And, and in the era of, of COVID, it, it might present a few more challenges. So uh, my, my name's Ed Newman. I'm a um, neurologist with an interest in movement disorders. Um, and I'm gonna talk about non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. Because we're, we're dealing with in, in, the, in the COVID era, we'll, we'll, I'll talk a bit about the challenges that telephone and telemedicine present. I have a bit of a background in telemedicine in that we have a um, a cohort of Parkinson's patients in the Western Isles that we um, have a monthly clinic with that we do telemedicine. But as Richard was referring to a bit earlier on, that's a hospital to hospital VC connection. That's that that's not the same as as as, as what you're being asked to do um, uh, today. However, it does give me a bit of a experience in, in su some of the difficulties in, in in communicating some of these um, fairly challenging symptoms. So, in terms of non-motor symptoms. Um, I'll talk about what they are, um, whether or not they're important, um, how we go about identifying them, and, and, and what treatment options are, um, um, are, are available for them. So this, this, this slide illustrates the fact that, that there, is, there is a large number of, uh, of non-motor symptoms, and um, they, they, I've arranged these in, in, in a kind of they start with cognitive, they move, move on to mood and behavioural disturbance, sleep disturbance, autonomic disturbance, and then speech and swallowing difficulties. And these will have a, um, so, so you'll see that, that there's, a, there's a really broad range. This does not mean that every patient who has Parkinson's disease will tick the box for all of these symptoms, but it's, it's unusual to, to find someone who's got a pure motor syndrome and doesn't, doesn't describe you know, uh, even, even several of these symptoms. I have to confess, I'm I'm fairly guilty in 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 thinking of Parkinson's disease as a as, as primarily a motor disorder, and that's that's a traditional uh, that's a traditional view, and it's pro these symptoms um, have, have probably been uh, overlooked uh, in, in that regard. I've also perhaps approached some of the non-motor literature with a, a little bit of cynicism, um, thinking that that some of it is. Is 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 slightly um, is is slightly overstated, but we'll, we'll come we'll come back to that a bit later on. Um, the non-motor symptoms, some of them you'll you'll see that actually um, are, are present pre-diagnostic. So within the pre pre-motor or pre-diagnostic phase of Parkinson's disease, it's common to experience um, depression, anxiety, constipation, um, REM sleep behavior disorders. Um, other non-motor symptoms seem to be uh, associated with advancing uh, disease. A lot of these symptoms do not appear to be, uh, as a result, of, do not appear to occur as a result of dopaminergic dysfunction. And that means that the drugs that are, are prescribed for Parkinson's disease don't tend to improve the symptoms. Um, and we're a bit limited in understanding what the, the pathophysiology for all of these different uh, symptoms is. Another problem is, is some of these, some of these um, um, can be triggered or worsened by drug therapies. And the classic example of that is um, dopaminergic therapies causing uh, hallucinations or uh, impulsivity and impulse control disorders. And any doctor looking after Parkinson patients will tell you that uh, uh, patients who have impulsivity or, or, or ICDs are, um, can, 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 can you know, cause a lot, a, a lot of distress to both the family and also be kind of labor intensive for the clinician as well. Do you know, there actually, I, I was looking for some prevalence data on non-motor symptoms that's recent and there isn't, there isn't, a, there isn't a huge amount that, um, that you'll find that is um, uh, recent, but what, what you'll find is 
there are high levels, particularly on constant difficulties with concentration, problems with anxiety, insomnia, fatigue, constipation, and uh, and urinary disturbance. So these 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 in, in where they have attempted to um, assess the, uh, the the prevalence of non-motor symptoms, those those always score high, you know, up up to fifty. Percent and over. Um, we recognise that not only the number of non-motor symptoms, but um, um, so the more non-motor symptoms that a patient has, um, the the this correlates with poor quality of life for both the patient uh, and the carers. There are some of these symptoms um, that that will fluctuate in with the medication. So the traditional motor fluctuations when Patients have off symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the increased tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, that improve with medication and then wear off as that medication wears off. Some of the non-motor symptoms are also present as part of an off state and um, fatigue, depression, anxiety, poor concentration uh, are, are examples of those. There appears to be some, some examples of genetic influences in, um, in non-motor symptoms. So patients who've got um, although single gene mutations are, 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 are kind of rare causes of Parkinson's disease in the overall population, if you've got a GBA mutation giving rise to Parkinson's disease, it can be associated with, with um, 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 a higher prevalence of dementia. Sleep disorders are seen a bit more frequently in LARC2 mutations. So there, is a couple of, there, there are a couple of phenotypes of Parkinson's disease where you are seeing more non-motor symptoms. Identification of non-motor symptoms, I haven't, you, you can't, within a clinic, it's really hard to, um, you're not going to go through a list of, you know, you've got 15 minute consultation, you're not going to go through a list of 30 symptoms and, and ask the patient to score them. I um, did my best um, to ignore non-motor symptoms for a while, and then um, having participated in the Parkinson's UK audit, you, you one of the outcomes is how much you look at the non-motor symptoms. So I, I started using the non-motor symptoms questionnaire that's the, 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 that you can download from the Parkinson's UK website. And um, I, will, um, I, don't, I will either send these forms out in, in advance, ask the nurses to perform them, or the patients will just email me them um, in advance of the consultation. Um, this, this is a, a fairly kind of wide ranging, uh, but simple to perform, um, um, checklist that the patient can go through. Sometimes they perform it before the before the consultation. Other times they can they can do it in the waiting room. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to have a, a um, um, good access to Parkinson's disease nurse, then, then then obviously they can ensure it's done for each of the um, each of the clinics or at least once a year. What about treatment options for for non-motor symptoms? Um, you, you'll 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 know that that the majority of drug development in Parkinson's disease and particularly um, uh, treatments for advanced disease are focused on the, on, on the motor fluctuations and, and, um, and, and the motor symptoms. The, um, the, there was a recent, uh, 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 kind of, um, the next few slides are gonna draw on this recent um, evidence-based review um, published last year that looks at, at, at some studies that have been done uh, in, in, in particular non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease. The, the, the quality of these studies uh, varies really considerably, so I've tried to summarize this um, um, in broad terms. But if, um, if the symptoms are depression, then, then, um, um, then pramipexol, venlafaxine, nortriptyline, and cognitive behavioral therapies all have got some, um, uh, some evidence base. Pramipexol as, as a dopamine agonist is also associated with other side effects and might, might take you away from uh, uh, doing that regularly. Parkinson's services vary a little bit in terms of their management of, um, of dementia. Sometimes that's referred into old age uh, psychiatry clinics, um, certainly locally in, in, in Glasgow. Other times uh, you don't have access to those um, and um, 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 you'll, you'll initiate the cognitive enhancers themselves. But the evidence base is strongest for river stigmine in, in that regard. Psychosis is a really challenging thing to come across in, in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, um, Getting access, so the best evidence is, is for clozapine and a drug that's not quite not yet available in, in, in the UK, uh, uh, Pimavanserin, I can't say that very easily. Um, clozapine is, 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 is challenging to persuade the psychiatrist to, to, to use because it requires careful monitoring. Uh, so, so some of us you know, get a bit more used to, to, to using uh, olanzapine and other uh, atypical antipsychotics. 
Insomnia, um, there, there's, a, there's some evidence that retigotine helps that um, in terms of overnight sleep, but, but, but a bit limited. And um, the, um, the, the evidence for fatigue and uh, uh, treating fatigue and apathy is, is, is um, a, a bit dubious too. In this slide, I talk about the autonomic symptoms. These, these again, are fairly frequent in, in, in a Parkinson's disease clinic. We've been using fludrocortisone and midodrine quite regularly as a treatment for um, orthostatic hypertension for, for a long period of time. But actually, the evidence base for them is, is, is fairly, fairly shaky. Uh, there's a new drug, um, Droxidopa, that, that, that there's a, that, that a couple of promising studies, and that might be something that we're using a bit more as, uh, as, as time goes on. Good evidence base for using sildenafil. Um, urinary dysfunction is, is, is a tricky one. That there aren't that many studies that specifically look at Parkinson's disease patients. I'm always a little bit concerned in, in, in the older patients that they have an underlying that they should be seeing a urologist and it's one of the areas I feel a little bit uncomfortable prescribing medications um, um, for. Drooling, there, um, there's some evidence for glycopyrrolate but, but um, the, the, the new use of um, zeamin or bot, uh, type A botulinum toxin is it's safe and efficacious and we, we recently started using it well, in the pre-COVID era and that seems to be, uh, seems to be fairly useful. Constipation, um, um, probiotics and, 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 and fiber is, is as, as good as anything in, in, in Parkinson's disease. So challenges um, for, for, for addressing non-motor symptoms are, are that you've got a 15 minute consultation and, we, and, and there, is this, there is this bias amongst um, Parkinson's doctors to, to, to focus on, 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 on the motor aspects of the disorder. Um, other things that we, we've got limited understanding about the underlying pathophysiology here and we've also got very limited treatment options for a number of non-motor symptoms including impulsivity, dysphagia, dysarthria, non-dementing cognitive symptoms uh, and, and, and pain as well. My experience in um, the telemedicine service that we run to um, uh, the Western Isles is that addressing that once the patient has a screen in front of them Addressing a lot of these um, cognitive uh, mood disorders, um, particular and autonomic problems and sexual dysfunction and that side of things, is um, they're less likely to do it, and the le less it's it's a di it's a difficult consultation um, via telemedicine, and that's why actually getting the patients to to to, to complete the um, um, complete a form um, and, and send it to you in advance of the consultation that will will will, will be uh, will be more useful. So um, for, I would I would just finish by saying that that you know uh, uh, fairly obviously the scope of non-motor symptoms is wide. Um, these have uh, th th these symptoms have a big impact on the quality of life, um, and, and and we should we should think about them and address them best we can. Um, and I'd recommend that you use self-reporting scales such as the non-motor symptoms questionnaire. Thank you. All right, Ed. Thank you very much indeed. That that was a, that was a, a massive topic to expect you to cover in short, such a short space of time. So uh, so 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 well done, and thank you very much indeed for doing that. Um, one question's popped up, which you may have seen. A question about: Do you use pyridostigmine uh, for orthostatic hypotension? I I, I haven't. Um, have, have you? No. 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 Um, I mean, I, I must admit, I, I mean, I, I sort of understand the logic of asking about it, but I, 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 I must admit, and I'm not sure I've ever seen it particularly used. No. Um, uh, I mean, as, as you know, the NICE guidelines uh, from when about three years ago updated and suggested that because because midodrine has a license for treating orthostatic hypotension, that seems to have taken first place over fludrocortisone. But my, my, my understanding is the only reason is because it's licensed. Whereas fluid cortisone isn't licensed, rather yeah. because there's any great evidence. I, th I, I think that they, they both seem to be pretty equal, and uh, you know, um, I, if anything, else, I, I think the fluid cortisone was slightly e better tolerated. But it, but I, I haven't. It, I suppose I haven't prescribed that that many numbers to to, to have a big opinion on that. Sure. Well, I, no, well, I, in my own anecdotal experience, it doesn't really matter what you prescribe. They're both equally poor at working. Um, is, is is my own kind of experience of both of those. Um, but so, so and now there was now Ross just uh, just just unmute yourself for a second. There, there was I think it's disappeared now, but there was a question someone had asked what your view was on the six CIT 
uh, yeah. screening program, so, the primary care one. That's very, yeah, very much so. And there's, um, uh, so it's a screening, it is a screening tool. And uh, like all screening tools, it's wildly hypersensitive. Um, and I can expect that if you add in the cognitive load of lo using technology for somebody in their mid seventies, it's gonna be even more hypersensitive. So that's fine. Um, uh, it, it's about, do I refer or do I not refer to a cognitive, uh, a, you know, a, a clinic, a secondary care, um, but it will be, just awful in, in PDD where you're trying to assess the level of, of functioning, the level of cognitive impairment with a view to advising someone. It's just not, not fit for purpose for that at all. Um, and it wouldn't be particularly sensitive to executive dysfunction, for example, no way of testing visual spatial function. So you're much better if you want to get a handle on those things. Ask people about the functional consequences, just like you were saying, of the, of the cognitive impairment. Um, and, and you may get a sense, as I have down the phone, um, of somebody struggling with word finding, struggling with um, uh, you know, turn taking a conversation, um, struggling to use the, the phone in the first place. Um, and you'll get a sense of, of if there's any auditory impairment, which can add to the cognitive impairment. A, a, it's much more than the test. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm regretting now having focused on the test. <laughs> Um, I think it's much more than the test. It's about it's about in, in, in sort of imposing the art of cognitive assessment on a very limited medium which you have, you know. Um, so it's much broader than that. But don't use the six sit for people with people with PDD. Yeah, and I guess it, it just reinforces that message, isn't it? That that thankfully medicines is not about much about the art of medicine as it, as it is about the science of medicine, and, and and that's why we still have humans rather than computers. Um, right now, Ed, Ed, back to yourself. Um, yeah, there's a question for you. You can see it on chat. So what what do you do in the situation where somebody fluctuates from hypertension to hypotension uh, and they, you get that toxic mix of antihypertensives uh, and, and, and do you mix that with fluticortone and midodrine? So how do, how do you manage that? I'm glad you've got to answer that question, not me. Yeah, yeah. Just, try, just hide and ignore it mostly. But I think that, I think, I think uh, sometimes you get a, a, a mixed picture and you, 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 a, a, a you know a 24 hour blood pressure recording can be useful in, in, in that in that context if someone in practical terms if someone is is uh, is falling as a result of um, um, postural hypertension or it's limiting their their, their their mobility then that's the thing that that, 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 you, that you need to uh, you need to focus on um, I've never the example of going from a systolic of 190 to a systolic of 80 is quite is quite a dramatic one, and I, I, I don't think that in in reality that that's something that happens regularly. Most patients um, who most hypertensive patients who develop Parkinson's disease will over time have a gradual reduction in their blood pressure, and that and 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 and, and so the focus because and you you find yourself withdrawing the the antihypertensives as a, as a general rule. If you genuinely do have um, um, so someone who's running super high levels of, of systolic blood pressure um, for large parts of the day, then I'd probably speak to a physician about about the best way to manage that. Yeah, and I, and I guess that if, if, if you're if you're foolish enough to read the summary of product characteristics, certainly for midodrine, there's there's a formidable warning about the risks of supine hypertension. Um, which and 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 similarly for fluidocortisone uh, as, as 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 well. But I think you're right. I think sometimes you look at that. You you look at the the number of hypotensive drugs that they're on and think about sort of withdrawing from them. And there's a comment coming up saying I've got a lady who's worried um, uh, about stroke with exactly those readings. Uh, not necessarily understanding, just fluctuates throughout the day. Um, uh, and some more comments coming up. And I guess very quickly, we're all realizing we, as neurologists uh, uh, and, and movement disorder experts, we're wading beyond our areas of expertise, aren't we? Um, and I think, I think probably we, in those situations, yeah, we'd revert fairly quickly to an expert, which, which in many cases is, is the GP, uh, because GPs primarily manage hypertension rather than ourselves. Um, uh, and another comment coming up, we've used Ibisartan, which has helped in this, 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 this situation, uh, based on syncope and falls clinic uh, experience. Um, so yes, I mean, I mean, joking aside, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult area to, 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 to manage and probably it's time to phone a friend and, and get some, get some uh, expert advice. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think unless there's a, a fl last minute flurry of questions, we, we, we might start to uh, just draw things to a close. Um, so firstly, just to, to thank both my 
uh, fellow uh, colleagues, uh, Ross and Ed, two excellent uh, and highly informative uh, talks co covering very uh, broad areas uh, indeed. So thank you both to that. Um, thank you to Sarah uh, and the Neurology Academy for setting this up. Uh, to, to thank once again Bial for helping to support uh, this endeavour. And finally, thanks to all of you. Uh, I think we got up to about 80 plus at one point in terms of, of, of attendance, which is pretty good for this kind of thing. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. And we'd very much encourage you to let us know about topics you'd like us to, 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 to cover, uh, because that's how this one came about. So uh, thanks very much for, for listening in and uh, we shall say cheerio for the time being. See you again. Thank you. Bye bye.